Hey guys, welcome back to Retro Rivals, and today we're going to talk about March game picks courtesy of Denver Gamer. And the very first pick on the list, Detroit Become Human, is a game I've wanted to play for so long. And if you're a little late to the party like me and you're just now picking it up and getting ready to play it, strap in, hang on, and prepare to be emotionally uncomfortable, morally conflicted, and completely mesmerized by a beautiful, poignant story and graphics that will blow your mind and have you questioning reality itself. The fourth and latest game development from Quantic Dream, a production company known for their interactive storytelling adventure games, Detroit is set in a not-so-distant future where humans and robots live harmoniously. Or so it would seem. The year is 2038 and androids have fully integrated into our society. Cyberlife brand is alive and well in every household and business across the country. And if the entertainment industry has only taught us one thing, it's this. That when AI becomes fully self-aware, it is a concept to be desired and revered. However, it is to be quietly feared in the deep, dark crevices of our minds. If I've piqued your interest at all in exploring this fascinating title, then please follow along and keep on watching as we are about to take a deep dive into my very first start to finish playthrough of Detroit Become Human. Stay tuned. You are now ready to begin Detroit. Remember, this is not just a story. This is our future. We follow the plot line of three characters. Connor, a sophisticated top of the line android working in the crime division, whose primary task is to work alongside Hank, a gritty, hard-boiled Detroit detective, to learn why androids are suddenly becoming deviant in mass quantities and to stop the spread of the virus at all costs under the strict orders of Amanda, Connor's handler and a high-level CyberLife employee. Kira, a late model android that has just been repaired after a suspicious accident, she is retrieved and returned to the home of her hostile, drug-afflicted owner, Todd, to care for his home as a live-in maid and nanny to his young daughter, Alice. Then there is Marcus, the main character of our story. He is a proud caregiver and an errand boy to Carl, an elderly artist whose relationship to Marcus is more father-son than master machine. Marcus is treated as an equal, a feeling being capable of choice, love, and free will. They are all androids in very different situations. However, they share one shocking similarity. They are all on the cusp of becoming deviant, or rather, becoming human. We are first introduced to Connor. This game doesn't play around. You are thrust into a hostile hostage situation. Law enforcement is smattered everywhere and you have a two-stage task to complete. Explore the crime scene and save the hostage. While sifting through evidence, you can recreate the crime scene by exploring the orange highlighted clues. Once all are attained, a model reenactment is formed in real time. You can rewind and fast forward through this all while changing camera angles to find better clues to develop a more fully formed hypothesis of the specific events. This action is a bit slower paced and therefore gives you more time to explore. Though don't be fooled, there is always a running clock. Time is not infinite in this game. With the hostage situation and any decision-based action, time is frugal. It makes searching a crime scene seem leisurely. This is where your decisiveness and processing will butt heads. Do I make decisions based on my moral compass? And how would I like the game to play? Or do I make decisions strategically and how I think the game should be played? There is always a third option of striding the line on both. For the most part, I followed my moral compass, deviating minimally here and there when it seemed like my decisions were leading down an unfavorable path. Connor was perhaps the toughest character to play, but we will get into the whys of that in a little bit. Next, we plunge into Kara's world. She has just returned to her home as previously mentioned, a dilapidated house 
a family in a state of chaos, no wife or mother to be found, and a young Alice who is shy, seclusive, and timid of everything and everyone. Todd is abrasive and quick to anger. Avoiding any unnecessary interactions is the best strategy, but not always possible. This beginning part of Kara's storyline is a bit slow at first, but it develops quickly in the coming chapters, as does Alice's. Marcus's story starts out commonly enough for an android, and is very much what you would expect. We first meet him running an errand for Carl to pick up paint at Bellini's. However, it is when he returns home that you quickly apprehend that his life is one that is lived, almost as a human. Carl, as a father, friend, confidant, challenges Marcus's perception of who he is, what he wants out of life, his very existence, and his ability to be self-aware, ungoverned by any laws. I think Carl knows his time is fleeting, crippled and health diminishing. He is questioning his own importance and existence in the world, what life really means, and in turn is concerned about where that leaves Marcus in the aftermath of everything. As the story progresses, we see Connor constantly challenging his coding, clashing with some deviant behaviors and thoughts. I really thought I had killed two of my characters right off the bat within the first few chapters. Connor was first to go while interrogating a suspect and trying to gain information while keeping his hostage in a safe zone between pliable and compliant. The suspect was in self-destruct mode, repeatedly bashing his head into a table. When a police officer intervened, the suspect grabbed his gun, shot Connor, and then critically shot himself in the head. Marcus, I also thought I killed when Carl's son Leo came to visit, demanding more money from his ailing father under the false pretense of needing it to sustain his way of life. It's very clear it's to support his ever-growing drug problem. When Leo breaks in later that night to steal one of his father's paintings as an advance on his inheritance, it is then that I have Marcus break his code and pushes Leo against Carl's orders not to. He falls back, hitting his head and seems critically injured if not dead. The police had already been called because of the break-in, so when they arrive to see Leo on the ground, without warning, they shoot Marcus. Luckily, this is not the end for Connor or Marcus. Connor is repaired and reprogrammed with all his previous information. He returns to assist Hank in the growing deviant cases, and more than that, he becomes Hank's friend. Marcus is not so lucky and is thrown into what I can only describe as an android wasteland. He must rebuild himself and all his corrupted damaged parts by navigating and digging through the salvage. Kira has problems of her own and must protect Alice. A drug-fueled Todd is on the verge of a psychotic break and is taking out all his aggression on Alice. It is when Kara is put to the test to obey Todd's orders or to break through her code to protect Alice that Kara becomes deviant, breaking down the invisible walls to do what she must, what changes her completely. Following through the storylines and digging through each chapter was not easy. Some of my favorite and most compelling moments with each character as we progress through the storyline were Kara's eventual breakthrough with understanding that protecting Alice was everything, opening herself up as to not only Alice's protector, but also Alice's mother. As Marcus dug through the graveyard rebuilding himself, it gave a sordid look into the world of the machines. It felt ominous and dark and created layers to the story that pulled you in a bit deeper. When Kara must find safety for her and Alice, so many choices and options that conflict it with following my moral compass while also making Alice feel comfortable both emotionally and physically were really hard. And escaping from Connor and Hank. This and the following chapter were especially hard because the timelines overlapped and I had to keep Kara and Alice safe while also trying to have Connor follow orders in trying to apprehend Kara. Running through high-speed traffic with a terrified Alice was one of the most tremendously distressing points in the game. The moment Marcus finally finds Jericho and salvation amongst his people, only to realize that the salvation he sought is falling apart around him, and that they are living free, but in fear and seclusion, which is no freedom at all. The first time Connor saves Hank when the deviant he is chasing pushes Hank off the ledge of a building. It gives hope that he has the capability of becoming human. Zlatko was another chapter that had me on the edge of my seat, beginning to end. With following him to the basement to being de-chipped, only to find out that he had plans to wipe my memory and use me for his own sadistic pleasure, as he had many other androids. 
his plans to kill Alice as she is just a liability, attempting to regain my memory to save Alice, and when I finally do, trying to navigate around his massive android bodyguard Luther to save Alice and escape the house. There is also Luther saving Alice and Kara by shielding them against Zlatko's murderous advances that immediately lead to the death of Zlatko at the disfigured hands of his android atrocities. Connor saves Hank again by shooting the Deviant in Stratford Tower. Hank is beginning to see the human in Connor, even if Connor doesn't quite see it in himself. After a touching moment at Pirate's Cove between Alice, Luther, and Kara, they finally make their way to Rose's house. Rose's hospitality, willingness to help, and Kara's crafty handling of the cop checking up the property for androids after the uprise. Meet Kaminsky is another pivotal storyline in which Connor has to choose to learn all that he can about RA9 and the deviant behavior by killing Chloe, who we see at every opening credit for the game, or choosing to spare her and show empathy but gain nothing in return. I chose to save Chloe, which in turn improved his relationship with Hank, but sealed his fate with Amanda. He eventually breaks his code when the character's timelines merge in Jericho, and he chooses to become deviant rather than to shoot Marcus. In the end, I was able to save two of my three characters and some of the sub-characters. Connor unfortunately dies in Cyberlife Tower. I made a lot of mistakes at this junction in Connor's timeline that sealed his fate. My biggest mistake was not moving fast enough in the tower to stop the elevator from getting to the 31st floor. I also forgot to disable the cameras when I took out the guards. Marcus abandons his peaceful protest in favor of freeing the androids at Camp 5 in Detroit by brute force. In the end, a lot of his people die, but he is able to free the androids, make it through with a small percentage of his army, including his love interest North. And the best for last. Kara and Alice make it to Canada. A lot of choices made this possible. How she handled the run-in with the guards, Todd, the family and their missing bus ticket, and subsequently deciding to take Rose's help and crossing the Detroit River by boat. We do, however, lose Luther when he is shot by the river patrol. Thanks for watching so far. Um, I just, I, I can't believe what an amazing game this was. And of course, like anybody else who has played the game, I have a list of my own pros and cons. So let's go to the cons first. The controls were a little bit clunky. I thought it was my inexperience with playing these sorts of games and possibly the dual analog, but when I handed it to Scott and let him try it, he found the same thing. But what I will say about this is that as you play, it does get easier. Another big con for me that will probably have people flabbergasted and wondering why I'm, I'm saying this is that the replay value is, it may get there eventually for me, but to actually replay it again at this time, I don't know that I could do that. Uh, if you play the game a certain way, if you play it following your moral compass, um, if you play it making decisions as you would and not trying to get a favorable ending. I find it really hard to go back and replay the game because my decisions would possibly always be the same. Another thing that may catch people off guard a lot is I had a really hard time liking Connor. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that Marcus and Kara were so much farther along in their self-awareness, I guess, or their ability to get there that Connor seemed so far behind and I was so far detached from him every time he tried to do something where he wasn't breaking through that barrier that it, I had a really hard time with his likability. He would have to make decisions based on pleasing Amanda and pleasing her? Hank, which really conflicted, but then also trying to catch all the she deviant uh, androids. And I just really had a hard time with this. I think because I related to Kara's character so much that when she tried to catch Connor, and we'll get into that as we got into that earlier, um, I just, I had a really hard time making a connection with him. Okay guys, so that was a really, really short list of cons. Like I said, I really loved the game. Um, and because you're always supposed to end off on a positive note, here's my list of pros. The graphics were beyond this world superb. I, I wouldn't have changed anything. 
they were amazing. An amazing storyline. It just had enough of everything that it kept you wanting to come back for more. You wanted to keep playing. You wanted to sit longer. You wanted to see what was going to happen to the characters. Another big pro for me was the ability to cover issues that could come across maybe sometimes gaudy, maybe a little bit sexist. And I find sometimes games don't know where that fine line is between classy and trashy. <gasps> okay, what am I getting myself into? I'm not a prude, but at the same time, I want a moniker of class in a game and I don't want it to just be for shock value. So when we got there and it was really tastefully done, the uh, love interest between the two Tracys was really amazing. I love that that was touched on as a uh, part of the storyline. So yeah, it was a part that I knew would be coming eventually without even reading anything. And it was one that was so well done. It was done perfectly. Okay, here's a crazy pro that you guys are going to question me on, but the replayability. And I know I mentioned that in my cons and I know I did, but there is so many options in this game. Your head is constantly spinning. I think there will come a time I will be able to replay it again. And you know what? Even if there isn't, for the fact that I picked this game up for $20, um, a used game, you can't go wrong with that. You can't, for 10 hours of enjoyment, to only spend $20, $2 an hour of fun. I won't mind that if I only play this once, it is what it is, but it does have a lot of replay value there. If you're somebody that needs to complete a game, needs to see the alternate endings, you will get your money's worth out of this. The music, the soundtrack, the score, whatever you call it, was phenomenal. It went really in line with the game. I can't even complain. It was perfect. The actor casting was really amazing for this as well. Um, I couldn't picture anybody else doing the voicing or doing the uh, full body screening for that. And it, it just was phenomenal. I immediately, before even knowing that actor uh, who played Marcus, um, his name is escaping me now, I'll pop it up somewhere here. But I had seen him on Grey's Anatomy as Jackson Avery. And I knew immediately when I saw the cover of that game, I'm like, that's that actor. And they did a phenomenal job in the entire game. Uh, same thing with Kara. I had saw her in, I do believe it's called The Killing. It, to see the contrast of the two characters and see her role in this. Like I said, this game is not a game, this game plays like a movie. So that's why I wanna mention actor casting because it it was fantastic. I couldn't have chosen better actors to play these parts and to voice these characters. And my very, very favorite pro of all, the ability for this game to possibly have a sequel. Fingers crossed. It left it in such a state that you could have a number two to this game. Um, my play through, uh, for instance, Marcus has just freed everybody from the fifth camp. Um, and I don't know where this is going. I don't know what happens after here. Kara and Al Alice just arrive in Canada. I don't know what happens after here. So it's really, really exciting to see where these characters will go and what will happen. I'm also thinking about the secondary characters and what happens to them and what happens to Hank? Where's Hank now without Connor? Because in my playthrough, Connor died. So yeah, I'm just excited that maybe possibly eventually down the road, there could be a number two. So I, I need there to be a second one to this. And yes, that is a big pro on my list. The ability for there to be a second game or there to be even prequels to the game possibly. Overall, I couldn't have loved a game more. This game is a hands down 10 out of 10 game. I just wanna thank Denver Gamer for making this one of his picks for March. I loved it. I can't imagine um, how the other two games you've picked for me are going to top it, but I'm super excited to play them. So until next time, please like, subscribe, comment, ring the notification bell, tell us what else you wanna see, and uh, please keep on watching as for the rest of this month, I have two more games to play. Uh, the very next one will be Little Nightmares, and then we have what remains of Edith Finch. 
Thanks so much for watching, guys. Until next time, game on.